So I'm not sure if you could tell, but that is that is amazingly fast. It it turns over and starts immediately. It has never done that. Hey everyone, Jared here, and today. I'm standing in front of my RTV 1140 CPX. So recently we encountered an issue with this and during the course of troubleshooting and me wanting to upgrade some things, I ended up going down the path of incorporating what I would consider a few upgrades to this. And I'd like to ask you to bear with me as I explain the entire story so you can understand the progression of how one piece led to another, led to another. So to start, I happened to be out of town. We had a, a fairly mild snowfall and my wife started the RTV and had it outside, was driving it around. Now she drove it around our yard and our field several times before it eventually died. It would try to start but act like it was starving for fuel. I called my friend at a dealer to see if he would be willing to stop by some point in time. Uh, and he was actually nice enough. He sent out a mechanic who took a look at it and was pretty sure that the fuel was gelled. It just was not getting really any fuel up to the injector pump. And obviously with it being gelled, the only way to get out of it was going to be pull it into the shop, get it heated, torpedo heat or something like that. And I didn't want them to have to mess with it while I was gone. So I told them to just leave it out and I would take care of it when I got home. So when I got home, I brought out a little torpedo heater, salamander, whatever you would like to call it, and put some cardboard around the RTV and then had the torpedo heater pointed underneath it trying to warm everything up. It took a good couple of hours uh, as well as, by the way, I added a little bit more additive, added some more fuel, and it took a couple of hours, and then I finally got it started. And in order to ensure I was getting fuel and that the gelling had cleared up, I cracked the lines on all of the injectors so I could see if I was getting bubbles and getting fuel up to the injectors themselves. Once I did, I closed them off and it fired right up. It stumbled for a good little while, but did eventually start. It's, it's the first time I've ever had gelling issues with any of my equipment because I, I always treat my tank. I treat it before I have fuel delivered uh, and really didn't think anything about it until I started looking back and remembered that the last time I had fuel delivered, it was in the middle of summer. I did not get fuel delivered before winter like I often do. So I was not running a winter blend and to me that made sense why maybe this did gel. So once I got it running, made sure I had additives, uh, went and bought a little kerosene, dumped into my tank, circulated it just to ensure I did then create my own winter blend and thought everything would be good. A week or so later, we ended up getting several more inches of snow and along with a decent wind, so it was blowing and drifting pretty good. The RTV started up just fine. And, and if you watch my other videos, you'll see I have a, a snow plow for my tractor. I have a snow pusher, so it's not like I don't have other means of, of clearing snow. But there are times where I, I just like to use the RTV. If I would like to keep the snow pusher on the tractor and not have to switch back and forth and put the plow on and, and hook up the third function, I can run out, do a lot of the longer driveways, long sections with this come home, get the tractor, and do the final cleanup and around the garages and houses with the pusher. So, so I still use this even though I have the tractor. As well as I wanted to make sure that everything was good with this. Uh, so I plowed seven or eight driveways. I pulled the kids around on sleds for a good while. Uh, I felt confident in this 
that I allowed the kids to drive this down the road to a steeper hill and went sled riding. They brought it back. Later on that night, I pulled the kids around for quite a bit longer. Didn't have any issues until we were basically really ready to quit. And as I was driving towards the barn to put it away, it died again. Same exact thing. And it, it made no sense. I just could not understand what was going on. So I got mad, called it quits. I just left it, didn't try to keep starting it, and thought I'd deal with it the next day. Instead of bringing out the torpedo heater again and trying to cardboard up, I decided to push it into the shop. So I got the tractor and my wife helped steer it. We pulled it down to the front of the shop and then pushed it up into the shop and I parked it and I just let it sit in there for a couple days. It had plenty of time to warm up and thaw out if there was truly a gelling issue, but it wouldn't start. Now I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and explain one of my complaints I've had with this, especially regarding fuel. This RTV, and I believe a lot of others are, are like this, does not have a filter water separator like a lot of the tractors do. It has only an inline filter, and that stupid thing is underneath the skid plate. So you can't even get to it unless you remove the skid plate, which is not fun when you're that far off the ground and there's a bunch of snow around. So that's one reason why we didn't deal with it when it was out in the yard anyways. But after pulling it in the shop and leaving it set, I thought I am going to replace that, relocate it at a minimum, and also see if I can upgrade that to a filter water separator. So started doing some research, found a nice little unit, and I will put a link to that down in the description of what I used and decided to order it. So it took, uh, took a couple days to come in. And when it finally came in, that's when I went down, started working on this for the first time. And it's now been in the shop a minimum of three days, may have even been four at that point in time. I thought I would try to start it just to see if it would start, but it still wouldn't start. So I dropped a skid plate. I used a little electric transfer pump and pumped out as much diesel fuel as I could out of the fuel tank just so I didn't have it pouring out of the bottom into catch pans or anything. So sucked that out the best I could, shined a light, uh, looked like I got the majority of it, and then proceeded to work underneath. I unbolted the fuel filter, removed the clamp from the fuel line, popped it off the tank, ready to catch fuel, and nothing came out. And I know there had to still been fuel in there, but it just wasn't coming out. So I poured some of the fuel back in there, still wasn't coming out, poured a little bit more to make sure I hadn't sucked it down below the output, and fuel still wasn't coming out. So I disconnected the fuel line from the other end, removed the two short sections of fuel line with the filter, and dumped them both out, and it looked like fuel was coming out both ways, so did not appear to me that the filter was plugged. So I hooked up a new section of fuel line to the tank and tried to get fuel to come out and it wouldn't come out. I have a Mighty Vac that is used for bleeding brakes as well. It's, it's got a nice little suction wand. I hooked that up to it, couldn't get fuel to come out. So I got my air hose and a blow gun and puffed a little bit of air into the line and it, it just blew right back at me. Air was not going into the tank. So I, I shot it again and again, and it ended up taking a pretty good shot of air for stuff to blow into the tank and for it to start gurgling. So turns out my entire issue wasn't gelling at all. Well, let me rephrase that. My main issue was most likely not gelling. Uh, I'm still not real sure why I was able to get it to run the first time unless it was just the fact that I was kicking up the fuel by adding fuel and additives to it and trying to get it circulate that allowed fuel to come through, or if it really was gelled. But regardless, the second time wasn't gelling. There was something in my tank that was blocking the output. I tried to stick my hand in there. I couldn't reach in all the way to the back. Uh, 
I used grippers. I, I tried all kinds of stuff, but couldn't really find anything. So I made the begrudgingly, I, I made a decision to remove the fuel tank. Removing the fuel tank wasn't terrible. It was just going to be a bit of a pain. So, cause I had to, I had to remove the seats, the seat back, seat bottom, plastic from both sides, just so I could remove the plastic underneath to get to a couple of the bolts on the fuel tank to get it out. Upon getting it out and dumping it out, and I dumped it into paint strainers so I could see what I caught, I ended up catching quite a bit of junk in there. Some of which was a little sludgy, uh, maybe bordered on algae, but the most concerning piece of this was I actually found little leaves in there. And still today, I'll be darned if I know how those got in there. I run a filter in my big tank. Any fuel cans have screens in the nozzles. I have no idea where those stupid leaves come from. Obviously, I don't leave the cap off this, but regardless, they were in there. And my guess is that's one of the things that was plugging up the output. So I washed it out, got it perfectly clean, dried it out, and reinstalled it. I took that time to run the fuel line, and I'll walk through all these parts here in a minute. Put that fuel line and ran it up over towards the battery compartment and hooked up the new filter separator I bought and then continued on to the injector pump. Now I, I'm sorry, no, it went from the filter to the lift pump, mechanical lift pump on the motor and then from there to the injector pump. I pre-filled the bowl as well as it's got a nice little uh, water drain on the bottom, sediment drain. I put my Mighty Vac on the bottom of it and suctioned that to draw as much fuel into the system as I could. Didn't mount anything, just set it in there and then try to start the engine. I could not get it to draw enough fuel, could not get it to start, and I believe that's because the lift pump was not powerful enough to draw it through the through all of the extra line that was now in place as well as that filter separator. So my next step or my next thought was I wonder if I could install an electric fuel pump on this. So I googled it just wondering if anybody had done it and I'll be damned if I didn't find people who have added electric fuel pumps to RTVs. Hadn't found anybody doing it to an 1140 but a bunch of uh, RTV 900s which same engine, just it's just shorter. Thought, well, hey, if other people are doing it, I don't see why I couldn't do it to this. I needed to make sure that I had a low pressure fuel pump. I needed one to turn off and not push if it, you know, once it built up pressure, it had a self turn off. And then upon researching this, I found that it cures a lot of issues. If you have an RTV, I will almost guarantee that when you first start the RTV, that thing sits there and shakes and shudders and idles rough for a good few seconds before it smooths out. And from what I understand and makes sense now is a lot of the fuel just by gravity drains back towards the tank and doesn't stay up there at the engine. So the mechanical lift pump has to work to suck all that air and get the fuel back going in there so it idles really rough for a good little while. Guys that switched to the electric pump said that that basically all went away for them as well as they felt their RTV was was more spunky. Not that it adds horsepower because trust me I'm not saying that at all but but there are possible fuel starvation issues that an electric lift pump cures. So I order electric fuel pump. So once again, you can see, as with many other projects with me, things kind of snowball. You know, I, I started on a project, I find a little issue, I try to fix it, which then might lead to another issue, so I fix it, and next thing I know, I'm, you know, I'm elbows deep into a project, and it happened again on this. So I now have a bunch of new fuel line, a filter separator, and an electric fuel pump to install. So now when I get ready to start the RTV and I turn the key forward, the pump turns on right away. 
That's awesome because that means if any fuel did start to drain out, it's got fuel all the way up there to the engine before I'm turning it over. I don't have to wait for the mechanical lift pump to start pumping and try to get all that air out of it by itself. It's already done. I also found out after installing that and just turning the key on and letting the pump run that I don't have to worry about it deadheading or supplying too much fuel. Once again, it's a low pressure, but the injector pump and the injectors themselves have overflows and hoses that all tee together, come back together and feed back to the fuel tank and it just dumps excess fuel into the fuel tank. For me, that's a huge extra benefit anyways. That means my fuel is getting turned over, it's getting clean, getting pumped through the filter separator, and if there are any cold fuel issues, it should kind of get warmed up by itself just by circulating. Or if I want to add an additive, do anything, all I got to do is turn the key on and just let the thing sit there and circulate by itself and it keeps the fuel turned over. So, so I'm super happy about that. Extra nice little few side benefits that wasn't planned. And so up to this point, I just have everything just plumbed and hooked up temporarily, just for proof of concept. I just wanted to make sure everything worked like I thought it should before I start to permanently mount anything. So the fuel's circulating, everything looks great. When I turn the key over to start it and the engine starts to crank, it fires up almost immediately. So, so I'm super happy. Then I have to figure out where I want to mount everything, which was not easy. So instead of just sitting here and having you guys watch me talk and explain to you where I installed everything and why I chose to install it there, I'm going to go ahead and grab the camera and we'll walk around and I'll show you what I did. So this is the fuel tank. I have the seat back, seat bottom, plastic piece on both sides removed, seat belts and everything, all just to get the plastic cover off so I could get to the bolts. The fuel tank has two bolts on the back side. The front were obviously easy to get to with this side plastic piece taken off, but couldn't get back there. So I decided to just disassemble this all so I can remove the fuel tank give it a really good cleaning and make sure everything was out of there. This little hose here is the overflow that comes from the injector pump and the injectors. And then that is the float level. But the tank on the back sits a little lower than this piece up here. And there's a T that comes out, which then runs back and up to the injector pump. So right here is the bottom of the tank. And right here is an elbow. It's going to be too difficult. I don't have this jacked up. It's on the ground, so it's going to be too hard to really show you the elbow. But the fuel came out, came over here, and then the factory inline filter was right in through there. But it came up here and then went up to the engine. So this is the factory fuel pump, lift pump. And that elbow right there pointing down is where the fuel line comes up from the inline filter from factory. So this is the outlet of the fuel pump and it would normally go directly over here to the inlet of the injector pump. So now let's talk about the changes I've made. I replaced the fuel line and inline filter that's underneath so I don't have anything other than just fuel line underneath the skid plate. It comes up comes up and over here on this side, makes its way through here, comes in here to the air filter and battery box, and enters a factory filter. From here, it's going to a fuel pump. This is a 12 volt fuel pump, low pressure, meant for diesel. And the reason I used a factory inline filter is to protect the pump. So if any junk gets sucked up, it'll be caught in a filter before it hits the pump. The outlet of the pump now comes up, goes back 
down underneath the same direction and now routes underneath here. There's a tube all the way across to the other side and I have it zip tied all the way across. So front of the engine, here's where the hoses come over. They just tuck down underneath there and they come into my new filter separator. This new filter separator has a filter bowl or a filter canister and then has a plastic bowl. And it's hard to see, but there is a drain here, sediment and water drain. This can be changed independently of this. You can change them together. Uh, if you break this, you can buy a new one. But I was always concerned that that I only had just a little inline filter. Didn't have a uh, fuel water separator, nothing like that. And I wanted to add one. And this is one that had great reviews, so I thought I would try it. But I couldn't find anywhere to really mount the fuel pump and the filter together. I could have mounted the fuel pump, I believe, on this side. But then I would be drawing fuel a long way over here to the pump. Really taxing the pump on, on drawing it, on lifting it. So I also would have had to run power further. So that's why I thought it would be best to put the fuel pump with the battery over there. There are wires that I'll show you here in a minute where I wired them to. And then it had minimal distance to suck and prime, but then it'd be able to push itself just fine. So, all right, we'll continue on. It enters, goes through the filter, exits, goes back down around here, and then I'll show you where we go in. So when the fuel lines come back over, they circle around, and it goes in directly. Kind of hard to see because I have this. This is the line here. Goes directly into the input of the injection pump. Now, I did not want my factory pump in line. And that's for two reasons. Number one, it would just create an extra place that causes resistance for fuel to push through. But the biggest reason is there's a diaphragm in there. If that diaphragm were to let go, the electric fuel pump can fill the crankcase with diesel fuel. So what I did is I actually, this is just a little chunk of hose that goes down from the inlet to the outlet. I filled it with diesel fuel and it just circulates. One of these days I may remove it, but this allows me to reverse all of this real quickly. Taking the pump and filtering everything out of the line if I wanted to and just using the inline and the pump was still good. While we're here, we will talk about the overflow. So this is a tiny little overflow line, goes up, daisy chains from top side of the injection pump through all of the injectors and then returns to tank. And that's the hose I showed you earlier. Now, the neat and nice thing about that is if I just turn the key forward and let the electric pump turn on, it fills all of this and then the overflow fuel goes right into the tank. That keeps the fuel turned over, keeps it circulating, keeps it clean, pumps it through the filter. Should, in theory, help keep it from gelling up. So now let's talk in theory about my overall thought process and reason for doing it this way. So I shared with you why I put the pump over here. And that is so it had minimal distance to draw from the tank through that filter. Would make it a lot easier on the pump. But then also, I have wires down here that are factory wires that were taped up, and I used one of the larger ones, it's fused, and comes on only when the ignition is on. So that blue tape right there, you cut it, and there were four round barrel couplers. I used larger one and then connected my power wire to that. So that comes on now only when it keys on. For the ground, underneath the air filter is the body ground. 
So the negative post of the battery goes directly there. I just popped that bolt out, put a ring terminal on there, and put that directly under that bolt. So now I didn't have to run wires a long distance. It's nice and short. Everything is in this compartment with the fuel pump. Once again, no room over here for the filter, so that's why it's over there. Now, another advantage I think to having the filter over there, number one, I can get to and I can drain it easily without having to take off any, you know, any skid plate. Uh, worst case scenario, I can flip the seat up and remove the plastic cover over the radiator. But the other advantage is with it being in there with the radiator, it's gonna get a little heat. It's not going to get hot, nor is it going to get hot with the hoses running in front of the engine, but it'll pick up just enough ambient temperature to help keep it from freezing. All right, so normally it takes several times of the engine turning over before the RTV will start, and then it idles rough for a little while until, the, until it gets all the air out of the lines. So uh, this has not been ran since yesterday. I'm going to turn it on and do just a couple seconds of the glow plugs and see how quickly it starts. So I'm not sure if you could tell, but that is that is amazingly fast. It it turns over and starts immediately. It has never done that. So uh, I am super tickled, very happy with this upgrade. So I hope you guys found this video enjoyable and helpful. And if you did, please hit the thumbs up. Let me know you liked the video. Subscribe for more videos and hit the bell notification to be notified of upcoming videos. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think. I always love to hear from you guys and I like to hear the feedback. And if you own an RTV and are running on the manual lift pump, I would highly recommend you do the same thing that I have done here. So once again, thank you and have a good rest of your day.